Thank you very much, Dr. Spaulding, for your <coughs> entertaining introduction. I, I regret that the pressure got to Larry Arn. <coughs> I thought he was more of a clutch hitter than he has proved to be. I yield to few people in my admiration for Mr. Churchill, but it has been a project of mine for many years to convince Americans that Franklin D. Roosevelt was, as he claimed to be, the greatest friend American capitalism ever had. However, I, I, I must say I thought that when I got the invitation to speak here tonight and the topic that was given to me, that this was a manifestation of Larry's perverse sense of humor. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to tell you more about Canada than any of you wants to know, but, but that's what I've been asked to do. Um, <clears throat> so, I, so I will. Um, I assume, and, and uh, the introduction confirms this, that I'm expected to denounce the wokeness and excessive political correctness of Canada that has aroused an unusual level of interest uh, among Americans in Canada. Uh, several of your prominent television and internet commentators have already conducted the obsequies of Canada as a free country. Of course, some of these antics that have caused such mirth and alarm with Tucker Carlson and others have been outrageous, and I will get to them. <clears throat> but just so you know, I have to tell you that Canadians, however they may be portrayed in the United States as docile and browbeaten by an absurdly faddish government, and it is absurd, of course it is, and Canadians know that, and they're about to jettison it, um, they are appalled in a friendly way and in a genuinely concerned way at the vagaries of the American system. Your media, I mean, I, I think um, the reference to what you're suffering in this country as postmodernism is flattering. It isn't postmodernism, it, it's, it's infantilistic chaos. But uh, <laughs> your media, confirmed by anecdotal comment from Canadian visitors returning from the United States, present many of your great cities as shooting galleries infested with pitiful homeless drug addicts where pillaging is almost a legalized form of wealth redistribution. You have totalitarian rates of success in criminal convictions, though robbery and assault are often now no longer crimes. And half the country thinks it is perfectly in order to indict the leader of the opposition with spurious charges at the beginning of a presidential election campaign. <clears throat> in the one country as in the other, appearances can be deceiving. Most people are sensible, and a great deal will be achieved in both countries with elections without, in the case of the United States, it is to be hoped, millions of unverifiable votes. Canada is not a dramatic country, as I've said, but it's probably more interesting than you think. It reminds me of Mark Twain's description of Wagner's music. It's not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> I remember from approximately 30 years ago when I was a newspaper owner, including, as, as uh, Dr. Spaulding kindly said, many titles in 30 states of this country, and, and, uh, and the Associated Press conducted a survey that found, is looking for the most boring headline of the year, and they produced the following soporific triumph. Canada responds calmly to changes to the law of the sea. <laughs> well, can you think of a more boring headline than that? <laughs> the fact that Americans find most English-speaking Canadians completely assimilable as Americans, which is usually meant as a compliment and appreciated as such. And, and by the way, Dr. Spaulding, you, you said it was a slip. I know that I'm joint citizen of Canada and the US. I'm joint citizen of Canada and the UK. but. I'd be honored to be an American also. 
Um, I may get there eventually. Uh, it, it, this illustrates the difficulties that Canada has had maintaining any credibility as a distinctive country next to you. For all our similarities, there are also conspicuous distinctions, and I hope you will pardon a somewhat extensive explanation of the reasons why there are more differences between Canadian and American society than are obvious. Uh, to explain the basis of my modest constitutional suggestions that I have been asked to make. F. Scott Fitzgerald summarized the promise of America, though by surmise and four centuries after the fact, in the great Gatsby of all places. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with this passage. A land that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes, a fresh green breast of the new world. Its trees had once pandered in whispers to that last and greatest of all human dreams. For a transitory enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired face to face for the last time in history with something commensurate to his capacity to wonder. He wrote this just 30 years before the space age. Canada is a colder and more rugged country. In contrast to Fitzgerald's rhapsodizing about the Dutch sailors, Jacques Cartier, the first European to see the north shore of the St. Lawrence River, in 1534, commented that it was the land God gave to Cain. <laughs> no applause, please. That's what we started with, though Canada got better as, as Cartier sailed up the St. Lawrence. <clears throat> Canada had to begin as a French colony because otherwise it would have been integrated into the American colonies of the British Empire. It ultimately had to cease to be French because the strategic division between France and England was that France had an invincible army and Britain was able to maintain the world's largest navy for 400 years and thus rarely needed an army. This enabled the British to take what they wanted all over the world, including North America, India, South Africa, Australia, and strategic points from Gibraltar to Suez, Singapore, and Hong Kong. France was consigned to Britain's leavings. Canada was bound to become British eventually, but for an independent country ever to arise in the northern half of this continent, the transition of Canada from the French to the British had to occur as the Americans ceased to be British. Again, otherwise, Canada would have been swept up in the American Revolution. It was by a narrow margin that Benjamin Franklin and the then loyal revolutionary Benedict Arnold were sent packing from the approaches to Montreal, and Canada declined to join your revolution. This takes nothing from Benjamin Franklin's accomplishment of one of the supreme triumphs in all of diplomatic history, in playing an important role in persuading the British under the elder William Pitt, the Earl of Chatham, to expel the French from North America, and 15 years later, in persuading the King of France, an absolute monarch, though not for long, to come to war on behalf of the United States and in favor of Republican democracy and colonial secession, causes that were anathema to the French monarchy. Canada was only able to resist the American revolutionaries and again in the War of 1812 because the British promised the French Canadians full protection of the French language, the Roman Catholic religion, which was discriminated against in England, and French civil law in exchange for French Canadian loyalty to the British crown. Both sides kept these promises, and they led to Jefferson's outrageous claim in the Declaration of Independence 
that King George III was trying to propagate popery in the American colonies. Poor old farmer George, who was admittedly a king of limited talent, but deserved better than to be arraigned as he was in the Declaration of Independence as if he was a defendant at Nuremberg. <laughs> <coughs> These histrionics of Jefferson were denounced with fire-breathing ferocity in Canada, and contrary to Jefferson's intentions, they greatly assisted in Canada's survival. It is a truism that apparently about a third of the British population, led by Edmund Burke and Charles James Fox, sympathized with the American revolutionaries, and approximately a third of the Americans sympathized with the British crown and many of those American royalists emigrated to Canada and they quickly transformed Canada from an overwhelmingly French country to one divided approximately evenly between French and English speaking people. As you know, from the War of 1812 to the outbreak of the Civil War, this country was walking on eggshells to try to prevent the dispute over slavery and the constitutional prerogatives of states from rupturing the American Union. Canada received about 40,000 fugitive slaves in the 30 years before the Civil War and treated them more or less as equals. John Brown, Harriet Tubman, and the model for the principal character in Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, Josiah Henson, all lived in Canada for extended periods. Because Canada does not have tropical crops like cotton and tobacco, there was never an economic argument for slavery. So in this important respect, Canada's progress was less complicated than that of the United States. This is not the place and I am not the person to dwell on the impact of the legacy of slavery on the sociology and challenges of law enforcement in this country, but every informed person knows that they are significant. I will only say that terrible as was the evil of what Mr. Lincoln called the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil, no country in history has made such efforts to raise up a formerly forcibly servile minority to a position of absolute equality as the United States has done. <clears throat> this process is not yet complete, but the nobility of it has, in my estimation, been underestimated by those who are currently most influential in shaping Americans' opinions of their country. Leaving aside the dreadful problem of slavery, Canada had the same aspirations to democratic self-government as the Americans and the British. But Canada did not have the option of recourse to revolution because Canada would then be overrun by the Americans. To gain political rights equivalent to those of its American and British cousins, Canada staged two Gilbert and Sullivan rebellions <laughs> of a few thousand rowdy and verbose men. These signaled successfully to the British that something had to be done. 365 people were killed. But it also impressed the British that the great majority of Canadians, French and English, had loyally united to suppress the rebellions. Coincidence and inadvertence bordering on the absurd uh, assisted Canada's development at this stage. The British mistakenly concluded that the French discontent was based upon the desire of French Canadians to be acculturated and become English speakers. And they united Canada into a single province to assimilate the French. Now, I'm sure many of you have had some experiences in Quebec. Uh, the French passionately desired cultural survival and are still obsessed by this issue. Uh, it, it, it was an astounding misjudgment, but 
Canada turned it to account. Those who were prepared to assimilate, those French Canadians, largely moved to the United States, which is why historically Canada was a large source of immigration to the United States. But the great majority of French Canadians are fiercely attached to their French status, and they have built a vigorous culture and are the second most significant French-speaking jurisdiction in the world. 